Hello everyone, welcome back. It's Space Engineers plus me, episode 69. I'm an Igneous and today, it's blueprint day for the Atlas, the whole Atlas project. The blueprints are already up on Steam. Links for the blueprints will be in the information box below the video. Today, with this video, we're just doing an overview of all the different parts and then we're going to look at a little bit of detail on how they work so that people can get as much out of the blueprints as possible, uh, whatever they want to do, whether they want to set up large-scale mining operations or whether they just want to build it and break it in as many creative ways as they can and have a blast doing it. It's entirely up to them, but it would be very, very helpful if we could show them in a little bit of detail uh, how it's supposed to work so that if that's what they wanted to do was make it uh, mine for them, that they'd have a chance of being able to do that. Now, we're going to take a look first at the main ship, because this is by far the ship that has the most going on. Um, it's not intended to be a particularly complicated ship. Most of the complexity is on the gantries here that are at the end of the outriggers, uh, and you can't really see it from here, but there's a mirror on the other side, basically the exact same thing sticking out over there. That's where the, the things that people might not grasp immediately are, but they aren't so complicated that I think uh, a person who is willing to sit down and kind of go through it with a bit of a fine tooth comb wouldn't be able to figure out exactly what was going on. So we're going to go over those in a little more detail later. For now, we have to keep in mind uh, that we can't just have a ship with a gantry on it because then it wouldn't be much of a ship. It would be more like an outpost or a station or something like that. So we've got a ton of hydrogen thrusters to enable the ship to get out of uh, gravity wells, get off of planets and moons, and also to be able to allow them to land uh, in um, gravity wells, planets, and moons, so they can mine. That's kind of one of the most important things that the ship has to be able to do. So in support of that, we've got, uh, I forget how many hydrogen thrusters. It's a lot, and based on our uh, early testing, it was more than enough to get the ship out of the gravity well of this 1.0G Earth-like planet. It was no problem whatsoever. It was quick acceleration to max speed on its way up, and uh, used not even 10% of the total fuel that we had set aside for the operation. We've got 48 hydrogen tanks inside the ship because running out of fuel in a hydrogen-based ship sucks. It's overkill. I'm totally okay with it being overkill. There's nothing saying if you've got 48 hydrogen tanks that you have to fill them all to 100% like I did. But I'll tell you what, if you've got access to an ice lake or an icy moon where you can dig up ice at a fairly savage pace with this whole mining system, it really doesn't take long to fill up the hydrogen tanks either. So that's something to keep in mind. So we've got the hydrogen thrusters and tanks for that purpose of getting uh, into and out of gravity wells safely. We've got ion thrusters for everything else that will allow the ship to maneuver uh, in zero G space, um, ideally, but also you've got a little bit of maneuvering capability uh, in gravity, in atmosphere with the ion thrusters. Certainly you can use the ion thrusters with the gyroscopes on board in conjunction with the wheels to keep the ship from rolling around if the, if the ship is heavy and the wheels can't keep it steady by themselves. Outside of that, there are no other thrusters on the ship. There are no atmospheric thrusters, so that's something to keep in mind if you're uh, expecting this thing to perform as a, a flying vehicle in atmosphere. You might be a little disappointed with the way that it kind of gets around. Is It's not really intended for that kind of movement. In the place of that kind of movement, we've got the wheels. Of course, we've got a lot of wheels because the ship is large and it's very heavy. And they're designed to allow low-power um, maneuvering you notice that the wheels are kind of stepped in the front and then they go down and there's four um, sets of wheels that make contact with the ground and then they're stepped up in the back again and this is to allow easier transitions various different heights of terrain but this is not a vehicle that is intended to go fast when we did early testing on the wheels and the setup uh, trying to go anywhere near top speed in this thing just basically launched it in the air and broke all the imaginable things when it landed it's basically slow going because it's a mining vessel it's not meant to be a race car this is where if you've got little uh, service ships, construction ships, um, cargo ships, whatever, we've got some uh, connectors that connect to the um, storage inside the Atlas. Uh, and we've also got some small cargo containers. There's one here, there's one in there, and there's one over here so that you have access to take things out of storage manually if you're building in the area or whatever this is probably the easiest way to get things out of storage and then we've also got this small blue cargo container for gas tanks hydrogen and oxygen if you need to be refilling those and swapping them around that's the option for that 
It's got entrances in the front and the rear, and they're all sensor-driven automatic opening doors. The Basically, the only part of the ship that can ever be pressurized as is, as, assuming nobody modifies anything, um, is the, the bridge at the front of the ship. All of this machine area is completely unpressurized. It's just too big to really think about trying to pressurize it. The amount of oxygen that you would need, the amount of ice that you would need, it's just... I, I couldn't justify it. These jump drives are currently unwelded. They don't take much to finish welding. Six large uh, cargo contain containers, three on this side, three on this side, four large reactors, two on this side, and two on this side, uh, which seem to be plenty. You can see now we're heading into the hydrogen tank area, and all of our hydrogen tanks are full. Uh, down here we've got my previous preferred method of setting up arc furnaces. The new method is going to be uh, an auto distribution method that we'll see in the next build. But for now, we've got 40 arc furnaces and they're in a fairly compact configuration. There's that bank over there and this one right here, 20 each. 40 is a lot. 40 arc furnaces will make uh, relatively short work of pretty much anything you can dig up. Now we've got the refineries over here fully upgraded with uh, productivity modules, I believe is what we used to try and get these things to process as quickly as they possibly can. Uh, we don't have as many of them as we do arc furnaces because they're much larger, but I haven't really encountered a situation where uh, I would really feel the need for more than what we've got. The want, yes, but not the need. So again, there's room uh, inside if people wanted to expand on what's provided. There's no reason that they can't, uh, but for, for beginning, this is not a bad layout. Now this is just the lower deck. The upper deck has more machines because more is better almost universally. Uh, here we have our assemblers. We have, uh, I believe we need, do we do, yes, 10 assemblers, uh, and they're all basically set to cooperative mode, so they're all uh, set to work on whatever the first one is working on in order to get things done quickly, and of course we've got conveyor sorters and all the other goodies to help control what's going into assemblers and what's going into ore processors and all those other things, and again, you can see there's a lot of room up here. Uh, that you could use for placing more jump drives, um, more machines for processing, whatever you wanted to do. This upper deck didn't see a ton of use. And as a result, even the conveyor system, I have to admit, is, is a little bit lazy. It's, it's not as compact as it could be. So if you wanted to put more stuff here, it, it wouldn't take the rest of your life to sort out how to do it, I guess would be one way of putting it. Now over here, we've got uh, some timer blocks. We've got three on this side and we've got three on the other side and these are used for controlling uh, certain things to do with the gantry when we're modifying the drop tab which you'll see um, in just a couple of minutes here to make it a little bit easier for the user to handle things but the, the the challenge with this whole system is that things don't work consistently all the time there's little um, random elements in the game that kind of determine uh, whether or not things are going to work exactly to plan or whether we're going to have to make some adjustments as we go so fully automating the system was not really an option but it's not the kind of thing where you need a phd in order to be able to understand exactly what's going on so we've got a few things that are automated just to make it a little bit easier. And those are handled for the gantry by these timer blocks here. Now we come in here and this is the bridge and we've got the uh, common airlock set up because this is an area that can be pressurized. We've got vents here and vents there. Uh, we've got our med bay there, control deck there. And then we can get to the front entrance slash exit through there and that's the ship so I, I'm, I'm fond of the ship for a number of reasons one it took me a long time to make it and it actually worked when it was done but two uh, we've got a lot of stuff on board and we've got room to add more and it's not difficult to make that addition if you want to so it's, it's got a lot of uh, versatility in order to be able to adjust things without having to gut the whole ship and start over so that having been uh, covered we're gonna look at the track ship which is the piece that fits into the gantry here and holds the drill ship. And this is the track ship right here. And the first thing that you might notice is there's not a single thruster 
on this ship and it's that way by design the ship isn't meant to be flown around it's considered a large ship it's a large ship grid but it doesn't use any thrusters it doesn't have any wheels that are used for propulsion you can see we've got some landing gears and the landing gears themselves are by design attached by unwelded light armor block frames there's some there and then this whole thing down here it's not even a landing gear it's just kind of a peg <laughs> that sits on the ground to hold up this end. This is designed to be built in place inside the gantry using a projector and welders so that you don't have to worry about how you're going to get this thing from the ground into the gantry. And that's very, very important to understand that is that you're going to be building this in place inside the gantry. You'll see what that looks like in a, a few minutes but i just wanted to stress that now the whole idea here is that this is this beam on the bottom is a track basically that the drill ship rides back and forth along it kind of goes back and forth when it gets to either end it stops it offloads its cargo through the conveyor system all the way up through here through this connector and the connector here is connected to a connector on the gantry all of this stuff goes off the drill ship so that it doesn't get too heavy and then when you're ready to lower the drill ship, you'll use the gantry to modify this section up here, which is called the drop tab, so that it literally drops one block, it stops, it gets grabbed by a pair of landing gears on the gantry, and you can actually see them a little bit here. They're, they're kind of far away from here, but you see there's a pair of uh, landing gears here that grab this drop tab so that you can grind off the necessary blocks and the position of the grinders in the gantry determine what blocks get removed and then it switches back to being held in place by merge blocks and then you weld it all up everything goes back to the way it was before you started except now the track is one block lower we've managed to lower the drill ship that is riding back and forth along this track by one block without using any pistons that's that's the rub that's the trick so i mean it's a very simple system it does have uh some small reactors i think it might only even be one small reactor there's one right here and yeah it's just that one the reason why it's only one small reactor is that all it's needed for is to power the conveyor system and that's about it the wheels here and these are kind of important um and kind of in keeping with the whole idea of the track ship is that once it's in place Aside from the modifications that you make to the drop tab, you don't have to worry about controlling anything on the track ship. It's all just very passive. It's there. It does what it needs to do. All of the things that you might need to control are either on the Atlas main ship or on the drill ship. This one is its just sitting there. It's just doing its thing. These wheels act as bumpers for the drill ship so that when it reaches the end, it's got a little, little bit of a springy thing happening at the end instead of just colliding with a solid object, which would eventually lead to damage, failure, and weeping. So the wheels themselves, they aren't meant to be powered, they aren't meant to be spun, and if you look at them closely, they're sideways. They're, they're not even up and down for the suspension, they're sideways so that they have a little bit of give when the drill ship collides with the wheel instead of this part here. Now one thing that needs to be uh, pointed out, and we'll point it out here and we'll hopefully I'll have some footage uh, a little bit later to clarify, is that when you're welding this whole thing up from the blueprint inside the gantry, up there, you want to leave certain blocks unwelded, which would be this row of blocks here and this row of blocks here. You would leave the wheel and the two blocks behind it, so basically from here over, and this arm and the wheel from here over, you would leave all of those things off so that you can position the drill ship onto the track ship, and then once the drill ship is lined up on the track ship, then you finish welding all these things so that they're ideally positioned to keep the drill ship from just kind of falling off the end. So you won't be welding it all up in one go, but because it's done with a blueprint, it's really, really easy. Even if you forget and weld it up and then realize after the fact, uh, you just grind it down, grind down the, the pieces and then get the drill ship on and then the blueprint is still there and you re-weld it. It's not a problem. Very, very simple, straightforward. So that's the track ship. But what I did, is I made a separate blueprint for the drop tab and only the drop tab. So you can see we've got, this is the exact structure that I used to make that blueprint. And it's basically meant to uh, mimic 
this section here without all of this stuff down here. So once you get the track ship welded in place in the gantry, you've got the, the drill ship on, you've got the ends closed up, you can switch over to this blueprint because it needs it in order to make the necessary modifications with the drills and the welders to lower the track ship, but without having to have all the system overhead and all the lag and all those other things of having a much larger blueprint for stuff that you don't need to modify. I mean, this is like 90% of the ship itself and it never needs to be modified once it's welded in place and the drill ship is on board. So we just put in a blueprint that handles that itself and we save a little bit on performance costs. And also, once the, the track ship starts to get lowered, you don't have this blueprint overlay that's staying in the original place and kind of an eyesore. You've just got this nice, concise little blueprint that's used for modifying the drop tab, and that's it. So that's the third blueprint in the set is basically just that piece there. And then the last piece is the drill ship itself. This one got a little bit more complicated than I really thought that it might, but it seemed like it would be worthwhile to kind of just sort of go with it. Because again, once you've built it from a, a blueprint, it's done. And it's designed to be um, as sturdy as possible without being uh, big and heavy and bulky and nasty. So this thing has um, a number of small reactors for power. There's a total of four small reactors that power it. It's got enough thrusters on every side to be able to maneuver independently. So unlike the track ship that's not meant to be flown around ever, this is designed to be moved around in 3D, you know, space, in gravity, outside of gravity, whatever, so that you can position it on the track ship as the track ship is dangling from the gantry. And then once that's done, the only time that you're ever using any thrusters is you're using the small ion thrusters on the back and the front to move it backwards and forwards along the track and you're using the large thrusters underneath just very briefly when you go to drop the track ship so that the weight of the drill ship doesn't pull the trap track ship down too hard and cause all kinds of damage nothing particularly complicated about all of that if it went over your head that's fine it'll make more sense when you see everything in operation but that's something to keep in mind is that the thrusters aren't going to be on and running and being used on a regular basis it's just the ones on the back and the front and the large ones underneath very very seldomly and for only a short period of time when we lower the drill ship so we've got a number of drills on the front and back and this is to basically make sure that we want to try and clear out all of the material possible in one pass. And when it's going back and forth, we need to make sure, say for example, that this is the, the part that's going that way, right? It's going that way. Having the drills on this side means that when it gets to the end of wherever it's going, we'll have cleared up as far as necessary for this thing to be able to be lowered when the time comes and everything will fit. So there's that, and then it's the same thing on this side. When it's heading in that direction, say towards the drop tab over there, it's clearing all the way up front as far as it needs to so that this thing can be lowered on this side. And then in between, we've left a trough, sort of like this. And you can see the striations in the bottom of the trough that are left by the drill, the craters that are left by the track ship that we just kind of ground down in chunks and let fall to the ground. But this, this whole section here was um, dug out by the drill ship. So that's kind of the, the shape that it makes when it's done. It's got a pair of landing gears, and these aren't meant to be left on once the ship is all set up on the gantry. These can be ground off and actually have to be ground off if you want to do any gr uh, drilling because they're set up lower than the drills themselves, and they're just there to make the construction a little bit easier from the blueprint, and then you can get rid of them once it's ready to go. This bank of connectors up here is designed to get rid of stone or anything else. If for whatever reason you decided you don't want any more ice in the Atlas, you can eject uh, ice. Whatever you want to get rid of before you send it up into storage or whatever, this is the, the unit that's designed to get rid of it. So we've got that. Um, I guess we could talk about this stuff up here because again, we'll start with the exterior and then we'll take a look at the interior a little bit more closely. You see all these wheels up top? These ones are actually oriented up and down. These are what hold the drill ship onto the track ship. So the drill ship is actually suspended by these wheels. That's where most of the support is coming from. 
you can mess around with them a little bit to kind of tune their performance, raise them up and down, do whatever you need to do. But in addition to that, there's a groove on the underside of the track that you can't really see from here. And these blast door blocks here are meant to ride up inside that groove to help keep it lined up so that it's going forward and back and it doesn't really have a chance to go careening off to the side for whatever reason. In addition to that, you see this welder? There's another one on the far end. And these pulse as the ship is moving back and forth along the track so that if there is any collision or squish damage on the track, the welders will help repair it as it goes. So it reduces the amount of maintenance you might have to do on the track ship automatically just by going back and forth, which is was kind of a, a handy little feature that I found is used. Not a lot. Uh, it, it's not a system that's hard on itself, but you do notice from time to time that the welders are getting used and you're like, ha, that's awesome that I didn't have to do that myself. In addition to all that, we've got the connectors. There's one here and there's another one on the other end. These are what connect to the connectors on the end of the track ship so that when it gets to the end of its little cycle, it can transfer whatever's in its container, its onboard cargo container, up through the conveyor system and into the Atlas so that this guy doesn't get too heavy. Very, very important that we keep an eye on this to make sure. Sometimes, depending on how the drilling is going, how the game is handling the voxels and all the other things that can potentially go wrong, it might not get all the way far enough to the end to lock the connectors together and make that transfer. So you do need to keep a bit of an eye on it. This is another one of those things that it, if it works properly, it's beautiful. And if it doesn't work properly, you'll look at it and say, we were, it was so, it, there was nothing that could have been done differently to make it work. It's just one of those crappy situations. So that's why we have to keep an eye on the system and not just leave it running for hours with an automatic dropping uh, algorithm on timer blocks. Because we could set that up, we could set up sensors and timers and stuff so that after it does two passes in any given direction, it drops one block automatically. You would probably not go half an hour before the thing was in pieces on the ground. Just <laughs> that's the way it works. Uh, so in addition to the connectors and the welders and the tabs and the things, we've got these wheels sticking up that ride along the sides of the track ship. So these tabs underneath do the majority of the work making sure that this thing can't go off to either side, but the wheels allow you some fine tuning to get it as straight as possible as it's traveling back and forth. It's, I would say, maybe not 100% necessary to have these wheels, uh, but they're there and they can be used and if you don't mind using them, you can use them. You could also remove them if you were convinced that it wasn't necessary with these tabs in place. This is the uh, bridge. The side with the glass is the front, technically, but it doesn't really matter. You can see we've got a control chair inside. We've got some conveyors uh, because this was getting very, very difficult to plumb everything together because it's actually very compact for everything that's in it. So the bridge has some pretty ugly conveyors inside doing its thing. This area is also can be pressurized, which I, I wasn't sure would ever be needed per se, but if you were doing something on a moon, some kind of mining on a moon, or even you found a flat section on an asteroid that was suitable for mining with this setup, it might be handy to have uh, a, a system that would allow you to pressurize this guy and do uh, the things that you need to do. The air vent is uh, in the roof, in the ceiling up there. And then we've also got... Now we've also got the airlock kind of set up in the middle. Uh, similar to what we have in the Atlas, just a slightly different configuration. It's all glass on this side to keep everything locked in place. Um, it's not pressurized in here. It, I've never really felt the need to pressurize the airlock, but it gives you an opportunity to kind of um, move around between the outside and the inside without venting everything to the outside. That's kind of the idea. So you can see in here, uh, it doesn't have to be spacious. You're really just kind of running in here to use this guy, and we do have that option to keep it oxygenated. Uh, in case you're in a zero oxygen environment and your suit oxygen runs out while you're in here. That's basically the whole idea. So now, you can kind of see a little bit of the guts. We've got an oxygen generator and an oxygen tank specifically for the purpose of supporting the idea of keeping this pressurized if you want it. And also, if you have some ice on board, uh, this guy will automatically fill up these tanks as it goes. So it's pretty convenient that way. We've got a large cargo container that holds everything until it can get to the end of the track and offload it and send it to the Atlas for whatever the Atlas is going to do with it. And then we've got the, uh, the rest of the thrusters. So we've got a large ion thruster here. 
and we've got uh, atmospheric thrusters over there and I think we've got another large ion thruster on the other side of the cargo container we'll just kind of kind of go confirm quickly I'm stuck <laughs> I'm stuck at the damn door let me out there we go there's a large ion thruster there's a large ion thruster and two large atmospheric thrusters which is plenty to keep this ship uh, from basically pulling itself uh, through the track ship when you try and lower the whole thing that's the drill ship so now what we need to look at is we need to look at the systems on the drill ship that handle the drilling the moving back and forth along the track ship and the transfer of stuff from the, the cargo container through the connectors to the Atlas and on the Atlas side we need to take a look at the gantries what they do how they do them the order of operations that take place in order to make sure that everything happens that needs to happen and, and that's and then you'll be good you'll be good to go you'll be able to uh, start messing around with your very own Atlas interstellar expeditionary miner <laughs>